Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle, and I am the co-director of the festival. And this is our final event for the day, Afternoon Delight. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I really want to put out a special thanks to A Mighty Blaze for partnering with us. And we are live streaming this event on their Facebook page right now. The co-founder is here with us, Jenna Blum. Um, so thank you, Jenna. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief just so we can get started. Um, so we do have the chat enabled. Um, feel free to have conversation over there, um, but we are going to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to take questions for the authors, and we will have a Q&A session once we're done with our presentation. Um, so, I guess let's just get right into it. Let me introduce our panelists, and then we can start talking sex. So, our moderator today is Whitney Scherer. She holds a BA in English Literature from Wesleyan University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Washington. Her first novel, The Age of Light, based on the life of pioneering photographer Lee Miller, was published in February of 2019. She lives with her husband and daughter in Arlington, Massachusetts. We also have Jenna Blum. She is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of the novels Those Who Save Us, the Storm Chasers, and The Lost Family. She's written the screenplay for Those Who Save Us, currently under option, and she's working on her fourth novel. And as I said, she is also the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze. Christopher Castellani's fourth novel, Leading Men, was an editor's choice for the New York Times. He's the fiction faculty of the Women, excuse me, Warren Wilson MFA program and the Breadloaf Writers Conference. He lives in Boston, where he is artistic director for Grub Street, the country's largest and leading independent center for creative writing. And last but not least, Stephen Kiernan. He's published nearly four million words as a journalist and novelist. His newest novel, Universe of Two, will be out later this year. He's also the author of the novels The Curiosity, The Baker's Secret, and The Hummingbird. He lives in Vermont with his two amazing sons. So Whitney, I'll turn it over to you. All right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Afternoon Delight. Uh, this is definitely the most people that I've ever said that to at the same time. Um, and when I got to my desk before this started, I found, I'm not kidding, I found this Barbie sitting on, oops, uh, sitting on my desk. She's wearing knee-high black plastic boots and sunglasses and little else, which felt extremely fitting for the panel today. So I thought I'd share her with you. Um, today we're going to be talking about writing sex scenes. We're going to talk about how to nail the opening. We're going to talk about why it's so hard to do it. We're going to talk about how to fill the holes in your narrative and how to push your sex scenes to their wildest and deepest potential. But euphemisms aside, why is it so hard to write good sex scenes? That is actually what really what we're going to explore today. Um, there are special challenges to writing about sex, and you know why is that? Uh, our, pal our panelists are going to talk about what they think when they're reading sex scenes, how hard it is to write their own sex scenes, uh, but we thought that we would start by um, just giving you uh, an insight into what, what bad sex can truly be. And so each, each panelist is gonna read a, a truly terrible sex scene for you, and we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna start with Chris, actually. Great. Hello. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's so great to be here. Um, and I'm going to start um, with read, by reading a, I had no idea that Morrissey, the lead singer of the Smiths, um, wrote a novel, but apparently he, is, he wrote a novel. Um, and it, uh, there's one called The List of the Lost from 2015. I'm sure you've all read it. Um, and I'm sure you all remember um, this scene between Eliza and Ezra. At this, Eliza and Ezra rolled together into the one giggling snowball of full-figured copulation, screaming and shouting as they playfully bit and pulled at each other in a dangerous and clamorous roller coaster coil of sexually violent rotation with Eliza's breasts barrel rolled across Ezra's howling mouth and the pained frenzy of his bulbous salutation extenuating his excitement as it whacked 
and smacked its way into every muscle of Eliza's body, except for the otherwise central zone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Morrissey. Fabulous, Chris. <laughs> uh, we'll go to Jenna. Dude, that's hard to follow. You had to call me. Okay, so mine is not quite as cool because it does not include the phrase bulbous salutation, which I'm also sorry to say, I don't know if I've ever encountered, but you know, life goals. Um, this is from my first Kindle book ever, which I purchased about half an hour before this panel, um, because I don't actually own a copy of this book, but I still remember from the 25 years ago that I read it, how terrible the sex scenes are, and they still are equally terrible. This is from um, Bridges of Madison County. And uh, I know I just lost like half the audience here. <sighs> She remembered how he held himself just above her and moved his chest slowly above her belly and across her breasts, how he did this again and again, like some animal courting right in an old zoology text. As he moved over her, he alternately kissed her lips or ears or ran his tongue along her neck, licking her as some fine leopard might do in long grass out on the veld. With her face buried in his neck and her skin against his, she could smell rivers, as one does, and wood smoke, could hear streaming trains chuffing out of winter stations in long ago night times, could see travelers in black robes moving steadily along frozen rivers and through summer meadows, beating their way toward the end of things. The leopard swept over her again and again, and yet again, like a long prairie wind, and rolling beneath him, she rode on that wind like some temple virgin toward the sweet compliant fires, marking the soft curve of oblivion. Ooh, now I need to drink. Like, this is why I have this drink. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, wow. Robert Miller. Uh, I always think about zoology textbooks when I'm having sex. I don't know about you guys, but that, that was fabulous. I think of temple uh, virgins myself on a river. Yeah, yeah, totally. The, and the smell of wood smoke. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen, we'll go to you. I just have to say first, I really like how Jenna went sort of Robert E. Lee at the end of her thing there. Suddenly we got some sort of Southern dignity. Um, <clears throat> I'm reading, um, I decided to go historical. I'm reading a poem uh, by John Dryden that was written in uh, 1681 just so we know that bad sex endures forever. This is called Song for a Girl. Young I am and yet unskilled how to make a lover yield, how to keep or how to gain, when to love and when to feign. Take me, take me, some of you, while I am yet young and true. Ere I can my soul disguise, heave my breasts, roll my eyes, Stay not till I learn the way, how to lie, how to betray. He that has my first is best, for I may deceive the rest. Could I find a blooming youth, full of love and full of truth, brisk and of a jaunty mien, I should long to be 15. Wow. <laughs> Take it away, John. <laughs> I think that the word heave should probably never be used in a sex scene. It's, it's just, an illegal word. Yeah, yeah, let's just like get rid of heave. Also moist. Can we just say like no moist ever? Like moist and is just not a good word in general. You no know, moist heaving. Yeah, I mean, they, they gain a little bit if you put them together, but just like moist in general, is just not a good, yeah, it's bad. So these are, these are laughably terrible. Um, I would imagine that pretty much everybody can agree with that. And, Yet, I feel like when we sit down at our desks to write, often, at least the fear I feel is that I will write something like this. I will include the word heave. I will have the throbbing member. I, you know, whatever it is, I will do it. And so I thought that we could open up by talking about, you know, why, why are sex scenes so challenging to write? And um, I, will, I, I will start with Jenna. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I, maybe it's just because I'm a big hoe, but I don't find the sex scenes that challenging to write. I like the sex scenes and it, it's probably not just because I'm from New Jersey. Like, honestly, I feel like writing a sex scene is an extension of character. 
So when I'm thinking about my characters interacting, like sex is a, a force that propels the universe, right? Like your need for sleep or your need for food or your need for connection, your need for comfort and company. So when I'm writing the sex scenes, I think of them as an extension of what that character wants at that time. Sorry, that was not a very fun answer, but I actually kind of like them. I find the dramatic scenes much more difficult to write. And I know that, you know, readers have pushed back at me quite a bit about some of my books and some of the sex scenes and been like, you are just fucking depraved. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like on a festival. But yes, this is, I'm gonna drop the F-bomb because it's Afternoon Delight Sex Panel. Gentlemen, how hard is it for you to write sex scenes? How hard is it? Christopher, we'll go to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I think, I don't know, I've been thinking about this and um, I mean, I think, you know, you know, I think Whitney, you hit on it a bit because I think that the main, I think what mainly stops us or, um, or stops many people is sort of the worry about what our sex scenes will reveal about us. You know, like what, what, how will people read the way that we write sex onto who we are as people and how we have sex, you know? It's almost like this weird kind of referendum on our identity and on some level on our coolness and our, our sort of status in a way. Um, so I think that right away, like there's this anxiety, like it's gonna reveal too much about me, which weirdly you'd think other, you know, other parts of what we write will reveal stuff and it does, but we take sex more seriously in that way. Um, and on that same note, like I think that when every time I, I write a sex scene, I know that, or, that the reader who's reading it is probably going to pay more attention to that scene. Cause I mean, admit it, whenever we all get to a sex scene in a book, like we sort of take notice differently than we would if we we're reading about the weather or you know, a description of a landscape or whatever. So immediately I know that a reader is going to be paying more attention. And so I put more pressure on myself to make it better, make it interesting, make it different, to, to describe it the way that no one's ever described it before. And anytime you do that, you're, you're, anytime you put that kind of pressure on yourself, you start to second guess yourself and you make really bad decisions, I think. Um, so, um, so it just gets like writing a sex scene, get like, like weirdly it should be playful, but it's like the opposite of playful when you're, when you're writing them, at least for me. I think that's so interesting because, uh, you know, Jenna said that she has more trouble writing the really dramatic scenes in her novel, but, but I find that writing a sex scene is sort of this moment of like high drama. Like, like to me, it's like, uh, you know, all these things have had to come together for those two people to end up in bed together. And so right. it, it, it's, it's this moment that is incredibly charged in the same way that like um, a gun going off or, or whatever. So I would love for both of you to talk about that, but I wanna hear, I wanna hear Stephen's um, perspective on this first before we, before we continue on that. First, I just wanted to thank you, Whitney, for twice letting me go last. So, you know, I have time to think about it a little longer. Um, now, I think that what, for me, one of the things that makes writing sex scenes the toughest is just plain language. If you're going to talk about somebody's sexual equipment, are you going to use Latinate words? That's going to be boring. Are you going to use kind of gruff words? Well, you know, is that the right for the voice for this book? You know, what do you call the sex act? It really, like the language itself it becomes kind of tricky. And so if you decide to use metaphor, bingo, like every one of the examples we gave, I mean, mine had a perversity to it, but every one of the examples, the language was really purple and overwritten. Christopher, they had snowballs and, <laughs> and trains, I think, or roller coasters, right? It's like, so there's the metaphors just pile on and every yeah. muscle and, you know, it's like, no, 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 that's not what happens. We've all done this, we know, you know, like we're human beings, this occurs. And so finding the right words. And, um, and I think they're also, um, at like dramatic scenes, there's also uh, power issues that come up uh, a lot. And I think about <clears throat> Nicholson Baker, who wrote The Mezzanine, and no, he wrote Box, which was a very sexy book. And then the one after that, I can't think of the name of it, but what this character could do is make women freeze in place. And he would do things to them while they were frozen in place. And it was completely creepy. And like, it was totally unsexy and weird. And so it's, that's the other sort of um, thing that, yes, Fermata, that's the name of it. It was just, it was this creepy book. Don't read that one, read Box, that was sexy, you know? But so, so some of it is, I think the salvation for that is to really go deep in character. And how would this character behave in this moment, he or she or they, um, 
uh, and then have that be expressed in their sexuality too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And be careful about the words. Yeah, the, absolutely. The diction matters so much. Um, I did, a, uh, I did a seminar at the Muse last year with Chip Cheek, and he wrote mm -hmm. a novel called Kate May, which is crazy Great book. sexy. So yep. good. And he was talking very uh, eloquently in his Chip way about, uh, about how he actually had the diction shift when different people were having sex. Like, you know, he's not going to use the word cock when the young married couple is having sex with each other, but when it's an affair, that word is perfectly appropriate. And I, yeah. I, I love that idea. I think that's, that's so right on. Um, and I, I wonder if any of you want to speak to anything about language or diction um, in addition to that, Jenna or Chris? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jenna. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's so nice. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about this now I, about, um, First of all, Chris, I never thought before ever that people might think it was actually me having sex in the scene. <laughs> so now I feel revealed. Thank you. Um, although I am reminded of an anecdote that there was one reading that I couldn't go to. So my mom went to the reading and it was for my first book, which has a lot of really graphic sex in it. And at, during the Q&A, somebody raised his hand and said, so Jenna's mom, why is your daughter so obsessed with sex? Like how she managed to have so much sex. And my mom was like, it just runs in the family, you know? But I mean, obviously people think it's you. They think it's you in all of your fictional scenes. So why is sex different? I guess, I mean, the language... It can be really cringeworthy, I think. And when I am writing a sex scene, I am a bit tiptoeing through the tulips or like sort of through the minefield of language to make sure that the language matches the character's mindset. And my first job out of college ever was writing the letters for Penthouse Forum, um, which was not actually a very sexy job, but it was paying the bills at that point. And then after that, I became a waitress. Um, but that taught me a lot about sort of pitching the language to an audience. So there was that whole like, dear penthouse, I never thought it would happen to me. And then you become really conversant with words for parts. I think if you're going to write sex scenes as a writer, it's always good to have a sort of a handy lexicon of words for parts so that you don't find yourself using phrases like tumescent member or the, the bulbous salutation. Like nobody likes that. I think like sort of, you know, being factual about it, um, and then again, sort of concentrating on the physical sensations of the characters is going to put your readers a lot more in that character's skin, which is the whole point of writing good fiction, right? Chris, I'll throw that back to you. Yeah, I mean, you, I, um, exactly. It has to, whatever word you use, whatever des description you use has to be in some, have, has to be tied somehow to the character themselves, right? It has to, it has to feel organic to the way that they would describe it. And I love what Chip said about how that shifts depending on who they are in what, and, and you, know, um, you know, who they are in what scene. Because, you know, sex like anything is about, in some ways about persona, right? You're a different person when you're having sex with one person than you are and having sex with another person in different contexts, right? So there's a difference between, you know, an affair, like sex that's happening during an affair and sex that's happening when you're, it's their, it's their honeymoon and they're, you know, it's the first time. So you're going to use different words for it. And it's going to be organic. And, and that's also true when it's a narrator. Um, if a narrator is describing something kind of high above the characters, the way that the narrator describes it is also going to reflect back on the narrator, right? So, um, so there's that kind of distance that's happening too. And so the narrator, the way the narrator frames it, um, the words they use is going to affect that. If I could add maybe one or one or two quick thoughts, I think they're kind of connected with what, what you were just saying, Chris, and with Jenna too. You know, and even Whitney before is is I think that when a couple starts to have sex in your fiction, um, <clears throat> that is typically the culmination of a lot of suspense, narrative suspense, and so it is. It's one of those delivery moments, and so if the if the question becomes like, when do you draw the curtain? You know, if you've had an enormous buildup of suspense, probably them just looking in each other's eyes and going upstairs is not going to do it. And so it's really kind of deciding at what point will the narrator or the author become demure or just say, we've seen enough. And sometimes it has, you have to see it through. You cannot, you know, if there's been, you know, in, in the, novel, the next novel I've coming out, it's, you know, I don't know, 300 plus pages before they get it on. And that's a long suspense. It's, there, it, there's got to be, 
well, it turns out there's 22 pages of sex, but it, it was, um, it had to be, it had to be the fulfillment of it. It's like a proportion thing. And then there is that question of when, when do you drop the curtain? And if you can't see your, the bulbous salutation that the curtain should have been dropped before that, then you didn't have good editors and first readers and friends to say, no salutation, pal, nice try. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking a little bit about the, the diction question again, too, which um, I, which you know, bring, bringing in other other writers' voices. I was thinking about Steve Almond, who talks so eloquently about sex writing, and and he has a point where he, um, an article where he gives about he gives like ten hot tips or something, and one of them is to actually not use any words, like to say like he reached for her uh, rather than like. You, you know, vagina or penis, and it's it's amazing how how easy <laughs> it is to do that and to sort of avoid this whole question of um, of you know the Latin word or you know whatever word it is. And, and so I think that's you know you can get a lot across just by gesture. I think. Yeah. Um, so Stephen, I think you touched on something really interesting, which is this idea of uh, a sex scene being necessary and. When, when is it necessary? And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit, because we actually have that, um, you know, we haven't really gone to Q&A yet, but we have this question that's been sitting there since the beginning of the panel, which is why are sex scenes necessary? Um, you know, why do we feel that we have to be explicit? Uh, and we can't just have like, you know, people's eyes meet across a crowded drawing room and then we go to chapter seven or whatever. Uh, so, you know, in, in, this, in this book that you're working on right now, you know, what was it that you felt that the sex scene was accomplishing that had, you know, had to happen, that the, the novel wouldn't have worked if you hadn't included it? Well, um, in, 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 the, in the, the novel I have coming forward, uh, it's a love story that's set amid the development of the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And the, the, so the, uh, it takes place in Santa Fe. It's where the woman lives. She's a church organist. And uh, the man is um, in Los Alamos. Uh, he's a mathematician. And um, they, they decide to marry, they are both virgins, and he's living in a barracks and she's living in a boarding house. So they have no place that they can go. And so they're walking through, they're 21 and 22 years old, walking through the streets of Santa Fe all afternoon. And everyone thinks it's so cute that this couple is walking everywhere together and all they're doing is looking for a place to screw and, and trying to find one. And then when they do, they have, they have no time and they have no privacy, it's gotta be really fast, it becomes transactional, so they get super honest with each other. And then eventually, the minister of the church where the woman plays the organ, loans them his car, and now they're driving around New Mexico having sex outdoor in all these places, and it is such a liberation that they are having from everything in their lives leading up to that. And, and there's one point where she asks him what he likes best, and, um, and he basically says he forgets about the world because he is against his conscience helping to build the atomic bomb. And when they're making love, he forgets about that. And so it's like essential to their characters and to the, his dilemma of conscience, that is the central dilemma of the novel. Um, and I think like, if I could for a second more, the, two, the first two sex scenes I ever read, one was in The Godfather, and I don't even remember what it is, but, what, but it was uh, the ex deep, exact details, but I was in seventh grade and the guy brought it to school and was like, look at this page in The Godfather. And it's a man and a woman very passionately having sex against the wall. And, um, and it's not until later that I realized that both of them are married to other people. And this is the Corleone family. And like, when you do things like that, lots of people wind up dead. And it was like an essential propulsion for the plot. And um, I won't give a second example, but I just think like, if it's, if it's gratuitous, it'll look gratuitous, but if, um, but if, if it has a purpose in the story, then I think it's kind of organic that it occurs. I love that, yeah. I feel like there is this line between, you know, what makes one scene gratuitous and what makes it essential. And so, you know, I wonder if um, maybe Jenna could hop on that. I can hop on that. Ooh, hop on that. <laughs> I'm hopping. Uh, Chris is shaking his head at me. He's like, no, Jenna, just no. Just 
she's always like this, like pay no attention. So uh, I couldn't agree more. And I have actually been scolded by, by readers and by other writers for having a lot of sex in especially my first book, Those Who Save Us and The Lost Family as well. Um, but Those Who Save Us has a lot of sex in it because the main character becomes the mistress of a Nazi officer to save herself and her little daughter when he discovers her in the act of the resistance, right? So one of the, the, writers that I was scolded by, it was actually really painful for me. It was before she died, obviously. Um, Belva Plain, who is one of my favorite writers as a kid, like my mom and I used to read her books all the time. She writes these Jewish family sagas with a moral center. Like I, I grew up reading her and she got her hands on a copy of Those Who Save Us. And then she wrote to me afterwards and said, you know, I really, I thought your book was fine, but I disagree with you having the sex scenes in there. I think it's undignified and you should draw the curtain in the same way that Stephen was talking about. You know, it's enough, like we know what happens next to give the characters their dignity. And it, I was so crushed because I revere her. I also think she was wrong because the point of that book is how the main character's psychology is scored and scarred over and over again by these experiences. And if I'm gonna write about war, and I'm not showing that aspect of it, I am being disingenuous and I'm hiding actual experience that's important to the human and emotional processing of war. In the same way in my third novel, in The Lost Family, there's a scene in it, a, a short sex scene, it's like a paragraph long um, set on an Amtrak train. Um, and now I can no longer go into an Amtrak train bathroom without having a flashback of my own imaginary sex scene. But the point of this book is that the main character, who is a Holocaust survivor, loves having sex in this moment because it slides him into merciful oblivion. And that's the point of it. And then meanwhile, the woman in the book who becomes his wife thinks about sex for connection and she cannot get there um, with her husband. So her sex is a sort of a frantic quality. If you're not thinking about the sex in your books as having a reason, then you're not doing it right because everything in your book should have a reason, like paragraphs, words, commas, sex scenes, all of it. Right, I mean, it's a, it's a sex scene is a, for lack of a better word, a tool like any other, right? For, for, for bringing out whatever dramatic element or whatever element of the character's personality or the shifting nature of relationships. It's, it's one, it's, it's an important option that, that I think every writer should consider. And, and it just as, as they would whenever they're trying to figure out the character's identity in itself, how, like, what is their sexual dynamic, you know, with themselves and other people? It's a piece of the puzzle of what makes a character. And then a sex scene is the sort of, obviously the illustration uh, or the, you know, the, the plot point of how that sort of plays out. Um, that said, I don't think that, like, I know some people think like every book has to have a sex scene or you have to deal with it in some way. I definitely, you know, don't think that. I think it's a tool, you know, again, it's a tool like any other. I mean, I think of a book like I, I, I brought along um, Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl as an example of a book that um, is about identity is about sexuality and therefore there's a sex scene pretty much on every page um and if your book obviously takes sexuality as a central theme then you have to figure out how to you know make your sex scenes deliver on that and do it consistently differently um but if you don't unless unless that's really key to your goal for the book then you shouldn't feel pressured to put in a sex scene just to have one you know, you know, I'm thinking about some the maybe the most devastating sex scene I can think of in the last bunch of years, um, and it's in Room. Uh, you know, the narrator is a five-year-old boy, and his mother is the captive of a guy who kidnapped her. And from time to time, he comes in to rape her, and she has her son go in the closet and and stay in the closet. And what he's supposed to do uh, is count the number of squeaks of the mattress. And he will say it was 357 squeaks. That's all the five-year-old tells us. And we have to imagine as readers, all of the horror that is on the other side of that closet door. And it's, it's, it's masterful and like I have goosebumps remembering like how chilling it is, 357 squeaks. And you know, so it can be, the sex scene can be for all kinds of purposes beyond like the romantic. There's lots of other kinds of sex that occurs, right? I would say most. Right? I mean, because if you're writing, I mean, sorry, that sounds really 
cynical, but if you're writing only really flowery sex scenes, you're probably not writing about the way people interact with each other IRL in real life, right? I mean, it might happen once or twice in your life, but most of the time everybody brings their own motivations, their own moods, their own physical proclivities to the table and they're intersecting at different times in their lives. And so if you're writing something that's only romantic, and Stephen, the example you gave is such a good example of diction. Um, which you were talking about oh, yeah. to me that like if you had an adult narrator saying it was 357 squeaks there would be something not quite right about that right but from a child it's perfectly organic so the sex has to grow organically out of situation right yes, from yes. The context yeah um um while well, we're having i have another i have another visual aid which is um th this book that was super helpful to me um it came out 18 years ago now, but it's called The Joy of Writing Sex. It's the, like the best, the best title, huh? but also like uh, by Elizabeth Benedict. Um, and it's like chock full of really good advice, really good examples. Um, and one of her main points is something that you guys have all, we've all said in various ways. One of her main, one of her main, one of her main points is that a good, a good sex scene is always about sex and something else right um it's it's not it's anytime you like you don't need a sex scene to like show you where show the reader where the parts go you know like everybody knows that right but it has to be have that something else it has to have that context but also that subtext right for it to work um and if it doesn't have that then that's maybe the best rubric to use as to whether you need it is does it have subtext um and does it have that something else because the reality is that the characters are always thinking about something aside from sex, right? And I think that is why bad sex is especially sort of useful and interesting in novels because it's so revealing of character. Like what is that other thing that they're thinking of? Like what is what is going on, you know, and you can have all of these different levels. Um, and I personally just absolutely love that. I love reading that. I like writing that, you know, I think it's, I think it's fabulous. I think Oscar Wilde said, said uh, Oscar Wilde, pardon me, Oscar Wilde said, right, that everything is about sex, except sex, which is about power. Mm, that's good. That's Oscar Wilde. He's good. Yeah. So I wanted to, you know, we're, um, we're already at 435, but I wanted, I, I was thinking how um, Jenna, Chris, and Stephen all write historical fiction and, um, and have in, I mean, Chris is, has his most recent novel is you know based on the life of Tennessee Williams. Um, I think everybody has sort of used uh, real characters in their work, and I was um, thinking about the uh, the particular challenges of writing a sex scene based on a real person, and I was hoping that we could speak to that for a little bit. And I thought, um, well, I thought I would start with Chris actually because I because I'm curious. <laughs> Um, it definitely um, required a different kind of research, right? Um, when it comes to um, writing a sex scene, when you know, and using a real person, um, and I think it wouldn't have been as much of a concern or or causing as much anxiety if, again, like so much, if it wasn't a gay, if it wasn't a gay relationship mm -hmm. in the fifties, which of course has a different charge, and you have to kind of contend with what their sexual relationship was like, said their sexual dynamic and how they existed as sexual beings in the world. Um, so um, I felt an added pressure, but, but it was more of like a, of an important challenge, you know, to try to, to get at that. So the kinds of research I did, I mean, I talked to somebody who was um, a lover, an actual lover of Tennessee Williams, who gave me some, you know, very good intel on, you know, some things that I was able to use literally in um, the scenes themselves to that that felt true to the identity of the character because I got it firsthand and that was really useful. Um, but what but then beyond that, what you have to do is you kind of have to extrapolate a sexual identity from what you re learn about them, like from reading their letters, their journals. Um, I mean, luckily Williams was very explicit in his memoirs, so he charted his sexual exploits. But even that, you you have to read differently you have to interpret because he also was putting on a persona and that's not how he necessarily was you know in his intimate moment so you kind of have to construct that for the characters themselves um so in a way it's easier like which is the secret of most historical fiction right is that it's easier because you have this stuff you can pull from you don't have to make it up out of whole cloth um so in that case it's easier but it just has that extra challenge of having to interpret something that other people have already kind of interpreted, so. 
I have a question about that, Chris, um, if it's okay. Sorry, because oh. we don't have that much time. But I mean, that's such incredibly emotional research. How do you approach that with that subject, if you will? Like, how do you approach the subject about that subject? Do you just walk in and be like, so I have to talk to you about Tennessee going bound to the bound? Like, how does that work exactly? Well, this is the joy of working with gay, gay characters and gay people in general, because they sort of volunteered that, like, there wasn't even a question. It was just like, it just was understood that we were going to, like, talk about that, to be honest. So, um, and again, if Williams hadn't been so explicit about his own, you know, sexual history and sexual proclivities, it wouldn't have probably would have been more challenging, but it was so central to identity that, that, um, that it was a pretty organic conversation. In fact, it was hard to talk about anything but that, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I think what a really important thing that Chris pointed out and is, is about the research in it, you know, and um, I know, you know, when I was looking in 1944, I looked at where did males live and where did females live? I did that research. What was the access to birth control? The answer was there wasn't much access to birth control. And so these become the circumstances around the sex acts. Um, and so like going and interviewing somebody's former lover, that's, that's right. That's a great source. But I think just if you look from the history, that will give you a framework. There are ancient, ancient, ancient temples in India that have, I think they're called friezes, they're carved there in which there are orgies involving hundreds of people thousands of years ago. I mean, there's a reason there's seven and a half billion of us, right? We like it, we like our pleasure. And so it's really about what's the circumstance, whether it's thousands of years ago in India or it's 1944 or it's in the 50s when Tennessee was working and playing. Um. So I wanted to talk uh, here at the end about any about the challenges of writing sex scenes in the Me Too era. And if any of you have felt that in your own work, a project that you're working on now, or, or even in something that you've read that you feel like you, you loved it 20 years ago and you know, looking back on it now, it's sort of um, soured for you. Um, and I was one. I was thinking we could start with Jenna, although she's looking very, very thoughtful out the window, as if she doesn't have an answer. But we'll go to her anyway. I hear you? What? <laughs> um, actually, well, I have it a little bit easier because I'm a chick, right? So the the novels that I grew up reading that I loved uh, that taught me a lot about sex were like Judith Krantz novels, um, which I stole off my mom's bookshelf, and Erica Jong, ditto. And I think Erica Jong's work has aged extremely well. Um, and Judith Kranz perhaps not quite as much, but then it didn't really age that well in like 1970 and 1980 either. There are lots of like dominant men dragging the women around by the hair, right? So um, I have kind of two answers to that. The first is the reason I was looking so pensive is that I have memory lapses. And so I'm trying to remember like, what was this thing that I saw or read recently that did not age well that I loved? And unfortunately it was Gone with the Wind, did not age well. Um, mm -hmm. In the book, perhaps, but I saw the movie again recently. I live inside this movie. I've seen it thousands of times. Now watching it in a more um, conscious era, I'm thinking, Rhett was kind of an asshole, you know? I mean, like he was like dragging Scarlet up the grand staircase and she's beating her tiny fists against his chest. And when I was 15, I was like, this is what I want. This is what sex is. This is what a man is. And now I'm just thinking, he's kind of abusive. So, you know, things shift and change. In terms of writing sex, I try really hard to make sex apolitical and again, keep it to character because my job as the writer is never to please the outside forces. Like my job is not to say like, what is my audience gonna think about this? Is my audience gonna find that this character is a caveman or is the audience gonna think like this sex scene is too scary or too much? My job is to be true to the characters because I'm the only person who can download them from up here where they live onto paper as real, individual, flawed people. So if I'm writing a sex scene that makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry, not sorry about that. If that's the way the character genuinely is and is acting and is acting out his or her yayas, um, then, or getting his or her pleasure that way, then it's what I'm gonna do. So um, I, I really don't think about the Me Too era that much when I'm writing. And if I did, I think I would not be doing my job. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, I feel like, yeah, that, that's the sort of thing I'm a little bit concerned about, I guess. You may, I don't know if that's even too strong of a word or not strong enough of a word about, I mean, you always hear people say things like, Lolita could never have been written today because, you know, we would never have been able to tolerate such a monstrous 
character and um, and uh, and read about the terrible his you know terrible obsession and what he did to Lolita, et cetera, et cetera. But like, if we're if we're if we're not writing about monstrous people and monstrous sexuality, or even just regular sexuality that has its monstrous you know tendencies and the, and the way that men are in the world still, no matter how you know how much progress has been made, um, if we're not still interrogating um, in its ugliness, like what like men's behavior and all of that, and putting it on the page. Um, then we're not we're not doing we're not doing our jobs right. If we're pretending that it's that that all men are sensitive and all that sort of thing, um, then um, then we're really we're really doing literature a disservice. Um, and if it's if if not for writer, you know, who's going to do it if not if not us? Who's gonna who's gonna tell these stories in a way that actually gets at the whole like the whole. Um, uh, f like the, the full picture of a person's humanity, right? Then, then who is? So um, anyway, I'm not saying we all like, that we should, certainly we're not, should be glorifying any of this or excusing it, but I think we should be interrogating it and, and documenting it somehow. I guess I should just add something about uh, that there's both, both these comments, but I think there's like a moral landscape that we work in and some things don't age well because the moral landscape has evolved. And I think like, if you look back at the last 24 or 36 months, there's been a wonderful, overdue, powerful, excellent, welcome evolution in the moral landscape of gender politics in America. And it's, I think in some ways just beginning, right? And, and more of that needs to occur. And that can only happen, I think, through story. That if we have, that if we humanize and populate these ideas, and we don't try to solve them or write polemics or be didactic, but simply say, here are the circumstances in which people come together. What are the dynamics there? What works and what doesn't? You know, that's. Um, I think, of course, we. Uh, I think critics would be very tough if somebody wrote something that was an apologia for. The, for a sexual harasser. I don't think that book would get published necessarily. Um, and, but at the same time, like when we deal with our characters and their sexual moment, that moral landscape is I think part of how we think now. And it's just a way to be careful. And we ought to be careful anyway. If we, you know, 20 years ago, we should have been careful in how that's manifested. And that's, that's like about how much compassion can we have for our characters and how much for our readers. And imagine all the kinds of people that might encounter a story. And, um, and you know, the thing that none of us have really talked about is sometimes if you really go there, the, the reader might get a little turned on and that that's okay. In fact, it's welcome. And, and that can be part of the kindness of the story too, part of the satisfaction of the suspense. And um, that also has a moral landscape because it can't come at the character's expense. There, that's my, that's my, Sunday sermon. No, it's great. It's such a good, it's a good place to go to Q&A too, this idea of compassion for our readers and our characters. Um, so we have, we have a bunch of questions here in the Q&A. Um, and let's see, I, this one is really interesting. Um, maybe a writer can't think about this when writing, but how does one write sexual trauma while being mindful of triggering readers? And I think this kind of goes to compassion as well. Um, and I don't know which one of you wants to jump on that first. Hop on it, haha. <laughs> mm. Are you are you looking at me again because I'm the hopper? You're the yeah. hopper. Well, I mean, uh, this is going to really sound terrible, I think, but I do write about sexual trauma. Like my characters have sexual trauma. My whole first book is about sexual trauma. And I was at a reading once, you know, up on a stage at a podium with a mic talking about that book. And there was a woman sitting in the front row and she had, she had tears in her eyes, like she was visibly weeping. And afterwards in the um, signing line, I, she said to me, I'm so sorry you went through that. I'm sorry you were a rape victim. And I said, oh God, no, I, it's fiction. It says like on the front cover, a novel, a novel. Um, but I take it as a great compliment that you thought it was realistic enough to be something somebody had lived through because all writing to me is a leap of imaginative empathy. Right? So whether you're writing about a way a character has a meal or a way a character is reacting after being systematically groomed and raped over four years of wartime, you know, you have to really put yourself in that character's skin and experience. And again, when I'm thinking about writing a character, 
please forgive me, dear readers, I'm not thinking about you. Like I am thinking about that character. And I think what, what Chris said about um, the sort of tone of it not glorifying like what I'm writing about. I mean, obviously if my character is being systematically raped in this sort of delicate and insidious way over the course of several chapters, I'm not gonna be writing it like her rapist is fabulous, you know? I mean, obviously he's making terrible erosive inroads on her psychology that scar her and trickle down to the next generation. Like that is the point of the book. Um, but I guess I would say about that, I hope that I'm being true to experience. I hope that that sexual writing accomplishes what all fiction accomplishes, I hope, which is that people reading it feel less alone because they can plug into that experience and say, oh my God, that's what it felt like to me also. Um, and I hope that readers who would be triggered by it would notice from the jacket copy that like this is something that's going to be you know a dark sort of grim read this is about world war ii and a man who, who is making this woman his mistress so maybe that might not be a great thing to pick up if you are going to be triggered by that um, but again i hope that the the fiction helps you feel less alone like i think that is what all good fiction aspires to do and sex is no different I guess I feel at this point to bring up the granddaddy of all of this, the writer, the French writer, the Marquis de Sade. And he wrote, you know, 104 Days of Sodom, which starts out, you know, as you, kind of your basic kink. And I think that's really there for numbing purposes. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, forgive me, but finally there's a point at which they take, I think a nine-year-old girl and they saw off her hands and have sex with the stumps until she's dead. And this is the book that got him put in jail. And the reason is that all of the characters in that book are royalty. They're dukes and they're marquees and they're lords. And so what he was actually writing about was not sex, but the decadence of the royalty there. And they paid him the ultimate compliment, which is that they put him in jail and called him a pornographer. And he was writing stuff that is deeply, deeply wrong and troubling and so upsetting. And this is what I mean about the moral landscape is, you know, that sex was, was uh, with the purpose of being upsetting. And so, you know, we can't be afraid to be upsetting, even if it's hard, as long as it's the right people we're upsetting, as long as it's the decadent royalty that we're upsetting, not the beloved reader. Chris, you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, um, I'll just say, hopefully quickly, that I, I, um, um, you know, I think what Jenna said about like the 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 sensationalizing versus not sensationalizing, like the, it's all about the intention of like how how are you if you're if you're trying to represent a sexual trauma or uh, you know there 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 are again a spectrum of ways to do that and you have to think about like the words you're choosing the way you're choosing to represent it so that it doesn't end up glorifying or, or sensationalizing, you know, but also there's something to be said for sensationalizing as a way of truly like forcefully communicating the horror of it. That is one way of doing it, but you kind of have to know you're doing it and understand the implications of that. I think of the opposite extreme, an amazing um, a memoir called The Body Papers by Grace mm -hmm. Toulousan, in which she describes sexual trauma in the most matter of fact, everyday way that that it actually makes it infinitely more um horrifying and 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 affects you so much more deeply because it's so matter of fact um so you just kind of have to know what strategy are you choosing i think the the mistake or the the, the trap that many writers myself included fall into is that we try to do a little of both like we make some things matter of fact and some things sensational because we're not quite sure how to do it and then it all becomes a muddle and the reader can't quite figure out what the writer's relationship to the trauma is you know um so yeah 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 makes sense so we're, we're almost out of time. I thought we would end with a fun question. And it's gonna be kind of, it's like a mishmash of a couple questions that we have in the Q&A. Um, so you can kind of answer whichever of these questions you wanna answer. Uh, what is a fantastic breakup or farewell sex scene that you've read? Uh, you can answer that. You can answer like, what is the best sex scene that you've, you've ever read? Or you can answer, which one of your characters would you most like to sleep with? And I'm going to start with Stephen. Yeah, 
Um, I, I think I'm going to say that uh, um, I'm going to go with the second one about the best sex that I've read. And it's um, two women in the middle of the prairie of North Dakota outside on a summer's day and they've ridden out horseback and it is in even even cowgirls get the blues and they are both so shy and so hesitant and then they just rock it and are like we're coming back here and um there's a lot of good sex in tom robbins but that particular scene i was about 18 when i encountered it i reread the book three or four years ago and by golly it's still a terrific scene <laughs> totally agree thank you great <laughs> How about Chris next? I'll just say quick, I'll answer two of them. One, there's a fantastic scene in Charles Baxter's The Feast of Love, where um, a couple is actually in the middle of a sex scene. Football stadium. Yeah, yeah, and, and well, another one, and like, and the, in the middle of it, they realize that this is the last time they're gonna have, that they'll ever be together, that they're actually, is. so anyway, that's a great book for, in, in, for, for many reasons and has lots of great sex scenes, but I remember that one as a farewell breakup scene that was amazing. Um, and then, um, actually, I'm gonna read, um, like, I forget which question this is answering, but, um, oh, the best sex scene I've, I've read. Um, uh, I don't know if this is the best of all time, but I've, I've just been actually listening to Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, which I absolutely love. And I'm early, early on in it. Um, but what I love about this moment is just how it's not about sex, but it's so incredibly sexual and beautiful. And um, anyway, anyway, it's, um, it's Patroclus, um, a young man describing Achilles, another young man who is much more beautiful and fit than he, as he, than he is. Um, and he's, he's, he's describing him and he says, I saw then how I had changed. I did not mind anymore that I lost when we raced and I lost when we swam out to the rocks and I lost when we tossed spears or skipped stones. For who can be ashamed to lose to such beauty? It was enough, this is the part that I love, it was enough to watch him win, to see the soles of his feet flashing as they kicked up sand or the rise and fall of his shoulders as he pulled through the salt. It was enough. Um, what's so great about that is obviously you never think of the back of the feet as any kind of sexual, you know, um, you know, any kind of sexual uh, part, body part, but the, 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 the description of the soles of the feet and the sand kicking up as, a, as an erotic um, vision um, is so incredible. And then you think of Achilles and it's the heel and you see the context and the something else about the something else-ness about that moment. Um, I just, I just love that moment so much. Um, so I had to, I had to include that somewhere in this. In the, yeah. in the Bravo. Amazing. I love that so much. Jenna, how about you? Uh, well, now I'm going to be incredibly anticlimactic following those two things, <laughs> see what I did there. Um, there's no way, like every time I'm on a panel with Chris, I learn from him and I'm sort of like enraptured by this. So thank you, Chris, for edifying us. And I, you know, wanted to get up while you were reading and go to my bookshelf and pull down a sex scene that was a breakup sex scene that I had a recovered memory of while we were talking. But then I was enraptured by Madeline Miller's passage, so I didn't do it. It's actually the, the sex scene that is a breakup sex scene that has very few body parts in it, but is like the most tender throat aching sex scene that I can remember is, wait for it, from Stephen King in a book called The Dead Zone in which a character goes into a coma for five years and wakes up and the woman that he was supposed to marry, that he was planning to propose to, is now married to somebody else. And they have one chance to reconnect even after she's married. She comes to him and says, we need to put paid to this. Like, this is wrong. Like, we, we didn't get the life that we were planning to have. And so the two main characters have sex in a hayloft. And it's just beautiful. And even without going to my shelf to look at it, I remember how, how King talks about how the woman's back, Sarah's back, is the color of coffee with cream, and she has a, you know, the bra strap is white against it, and time spins out in the sweet smell of hay. And it was just like, you know, I cry every time I read that. Um, and just to end things on a totally trashy note, I will answer the, the question that Whitney posed about which of your characters would you sleep with, because I've noticed on the chat, there's a sort of um, discussion about which of the characters in um, The Lost Family in my last book um, women would sleep with. And I have to say the main character of that book, Peter, who is very hot, although emotionally locked down, um, 
he's the book boyfriend of several women I know, including when we, that book went to auction, we went to a number of publishing houses and I was sitting in the boardroom at Crown um, and the women in the boardroom started having this discussion about who they wanted to sleep with from that book. Was it Peter, the emotionally locked down yet golden haired Holocaust survivor, or was it Greg, the Vietnam vet who is a giant in all ways. So um, the question was like, who do you want to most get in the hot tub with? Mm -hmm. And I will just say, hopefully his mom is not watching, but I would get in the hot tub with Greg because he's actually a real person who I put into that book. <laughs> uh, and you know, the hot tub was fine. It was fine. So hopefully that's not being recorded. Thanks so much. Facebook Live, my friend. <laughs> Facebook Live. <laughs> oh, all right. This was fantastic. Um, so, such huge thanks to our panelists uh, for such an amazing hour of wonderful discussion. And thank you so, so much to everybody who came uh, and, and uh, gave us wonderful questions. Uh, I hope this was useful to everybody. And I hope you have gone to a bunch of other Newbury Liter Literature Festival panels today and that you'll do so tomorrow as well because there's a lot going on. So, thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so thank much. You all. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming to the Newburyport Literary Festival. The panels, act actually, the next event isn't tomorrow. It's a week from tomorrow. So it's Ooh. Sunday, May 3rd. That's okay. I'm correct. I'm letting you all know now. But there's a lot more like it. You know it's been a long day because the light has totally changed and now I'm like, <laughs> in a dark room. Um, so anyway, this panel was amazing. And there are so many comments over here. I don't even know if you saw them all of people saying how much they loved this conversation. So thank you so much, everyone. Jenna, thank you for reaching out to me and saying, let's put this online because you're the reason we're here. So okay. thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, you all. Have a great day. It was an afternoon delight. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>